Well, today, we are announcing the new series, and it's called Walking as a Church. How about that? That's what we all look like when we're walking as a church. Um, that's the same guy. We borrowed him from the men's room sign, and we put him out there walking. <clears throat> And here's what it is. It's a five-part series. We're going to start today. And here's the five parts of walking as a church. The first one's going to be evangelism. And that's going to go for this week and next week, the, these two weeks in August. The next one is going to be discipleship. And that will be the last two weekends of August. The third of the five is worship. And that'll take place for the first two weekends of September. And then followed by fellowship, and that will be the last two weekends of September. And then finally, culminating the 10-week series, Outreach, and that's October 3rd and uh, October 10th, that, those first two weekends of October. And so what we are doing right now is we're launching the series with a message on evangelism. And I was privileged to be able to launch this and give the inaugural message on evangelism because it's, it is a, a subject that I am passionate about. I really believe that evangelism is a privilege. I've been able to share the good news of what God has given us outward. It's fun to do what we do in the church. We worship, we dig into the Word, we have fellowship mostly with believers. But sometimes the Lord, in fact, oftentimes the Lord is calling us out. And to bring that which He's given us, this precious gift of salvation and the good news, beyond these church doors and walls. So let's pray as we launch this new series that God would speak to us and show us what He has for us. Father, I thank you for this opportunity and the privilege to speak about evangelism. And I thank you for these men and women in this church, and I know so many of them. And I, I look at the Alpha Course video that was just put forth, and I look at a lot of the ministries, and I realize that this truly is a church that has a heart for the lost, has a heart to reach those who haven't met you yet and see them come into a relationship with you. I thank you, Lord. There are so many men and women that are passionate about that. Now, I pray that you'll speak to us through the Word of God and show us what you have for us today regarding evangelism. I thank you for this series and that we are able to dig into these five subjects that are so meaningful to us, evangelism, discipleship, worship, fellowship, and outreach. And I pray that you'll reveal your heart through your Word as we go and embark on this journey. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, I normally drink water. Today I'm drinking black coffee when I'm preaching because, uh, I, I don't know, I, I don't know about you, I'm just kind of feeling a little relaxed, you know, a little more slow. I feel like my voice is more like an overnight FM DJ telling you about the Word of God this morning. We had a late concert last night that we performed in, in, at the shore, and so um, don't worry, I'll get it going, I'll get it going. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to start with three scriptures. Our texts, our texts will be three scriptures, two of them, uh, all three of them actually, two of them from the Gospels and one of them from Acts. And it talks about how we are compelled to share the Gospel. And so let me just read these through, and then we'll go back and, and we'll pull from them and see what the Lord has. And the first one is John 17. In John 17, this is the prayer of Jesus in the garden. The, the whole chapter of John 17 is unique because the whole chapter is Jesus' prayer. It's his dialogue, if you will, with the Father. There's no dialogue with anyone else. It's just him praying to God, speaking to God. Now, it starts this way. It says, John 17, 1, after saying these things, and when I see something like that, I'm like, saying what things? So just a little rewind. What he just said was John 16, 33, which is, uh, I say unto you, in the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. He left the, the apostles there. He walked over, and after saying these things, he looked up to heaven, and he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son so he can give glory back to you, for you have given him authority over everyone. He gives eternal life to each one, and you have given him and this is the way to have eternal life, to know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, the one you sent to earth. That's John 17. Now let's switch to the book of Matthew. The very end of the book of Matthew, chapter 28. And this is what's known as the Great Commission. It's the last words that Jesus spoke to the apostles in this particular gospel. And he says this, 
Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given what? All authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. That's that. Then one last scripture for our text, and it's Acts 1.8. And this, this passage is unique in that it's the words that Jesus spoke just before he ascended. So he had already rose from the dead. He'd already revealed himself. He'd already walked with many and revealed himself to at least 500 people. And at the very end of this period, he's meeting with them. He's in Jerusalem. And he says this. He gives them a promise. <clears throat> he says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Okay, we can take that out. So we see three passages, all of them very meaningful moments in Jesus' ministry. And he's telling us something. He's telling us to go, to be his disciples, to go make disciples, to be his witnesses. And so let's just look at the, 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 the Matthew Scripture. This is what's known as the Great Commission. It doesn't say it's the Great Commission, but it's been nicknamed the Great Commission. And this is the one where we just read, and it says, Jesus came and told his disciples, I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and then teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've been given to, that have been given to you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age the Great Commission. And there's several components to the Great Commission that I want to look at. And then the first one was echoed also in, in John 17 that we just read, all authority. Jesus is speaking with authority. He's making it known. He knows it, but he's making it known to us that he has been given all authority. He's not subject to anyone or anything. In fact, right from God, he's been given all authority. And so he compels us with this directive, and he says, go. Not stay, not stand around, but go and do three things. Make disciples of all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And teach them everything I've commanded. The Great Commission. All authority has been given to me, so I say go. Make disciples. Baptize them and teach them. Now, where does he get off saying all authority has been given to him? Because he knows what's real is that God the Father is the creator of all the universe. And he has an only begotten son, and that is Jesus. And Jesus was sent to earth, and he revealed the Father to us. And John 1, 1 says that the word was with God, and the word was God. In John 10, 10, he says, I and the Father are one. He doesn't have to be shy about that or bashful about that. It's not a, it's not a pride trip. He has authority. He's been given all authority. And you know what? He gives it to us so that we, as his followers who are carrying his message, we walk in that same authority. That's why we can go everywhere and anywhere and make disciples and preach about Jesus Christ, the one true salvation of the earth. To make disciples. What does that mean, to make disciples of all nations? It means to, to lead them and teach them to demonstrate and instruct to them in their lives how they can be in fellowship with God and operate through the power of the Holy Spirit. Everyone, regardless of creed or religion or gender or anything, everyone needs to know that message. He's saying go to all of them. Well, well what authority do we have? The authority that's been given through the Son of God. We walk in that authority. The second one, to baptize them. Right under here, we have a baptistry. It's a pool. But this baptism is a symbolic, really. It's a, a, a demonstration of a public pronunciation or announcement of your faith. And so what he's saying is baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's the Trinity was mentioned right there. And so you bring them to these converts to a place where they publicly and through perhaps even the, the, the 
covenant of baptism make a statement that they are under the lordship of Jesus Christ. And then the third one is to teach them everything I've commanded. Teach them everything I've commanded. Jesus said a lot of things. And as much as Jesus was all about love and grace, reconciliation with the Father, he taught some very specific things. And he's asking us to take what he's taught and to teach these people, these new followers, these folks from every nation, as we are making disciples. What did he teach about? He taught about loving God. He taught extensively about loving one another, about the kingdom of God, about the fulfillment of the law. He taught about marriage. He taught about servanthood. He taught about ministry to poor, the poor. He taught about many, many things. In fact, the end of the book of John says, we don't even, we, the world couldn't even contain everything he taught. But the teachings of Jesus, the teachings of the gospel, are relevant to every person everywhere because all authority was given to him. And so that's the Great Commission. If you feel that, you know, you don't want to impose your beliefs on people that don't necessarily agree with you, well, you're not fulfilling the Great Commission. All authority has been given to Jesus, given to you, to go everywhere and make disciples. So let's look at the Acts scripture that we spoke about. This is Acts 1.8. It's the promise of the Holy Spirit, and that when the Holy Spirit comes, what will happen? Acts 1.8. Do we have that up on the, the screen? But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes. And I just want to tell you, the Holy Spirit fell mightily 10 days after this was spoken. The day of Pentecost took place just about 10 days after this. And you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and even into the uttermost parts of the earth, or the ends of the earth. What he's talking about here is, is sort of a, a concentric plan. You know what concentric means? Concentric circles, like if you throw a pebble into a, into a still pond, like circles will spread out farther and farther. And he says, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, which is right where they were. And Judea, which was a, the more general region about where they lived. And Samaria, well, that was a farther off region that extended to the northeast that was a place where they didn't go very often. And it didn't stop there. He says, to the ends of the earth. And that could mean anywhere. That means the gospel of Jesus Christ was going to go anywhere, like far-flung places like, you know, Siberia and Guam and North America, places that you'd never, they'd never even heard of before. And what does it say about this? He says, it says you're to be my witnesses in these places. So to be your witness. What does that mean for us? To be his witness in Jerusalem. What's your Jerusalem? Our Jerusalem here is um, Somerset County. Somerset County. Or maybe Central Jersey. Maybe it's your hometown. Our Judea is a little bit farther out. Maybe it's New Jersey or the Northeast. Our Samaria might be all of North America. And then the uttermost parts, wow, that might be Liberia or India or somewhere we've never even been before. And so the gospel goes out from the place where it began. Your Jerusalem may be your hometown or even your home that you live in, your family. But being a witness, what is it to be a witness? Being a witness, I'll tell you what it is. It's simply telling what you believe to be true. How many of you have ever had to stand on a jury stand and be a witness for anything. A few of you have. And so you know what your role was in that situation. Your role was to walk up, place your hand on the Bible, and swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and then just say what you believe you saw. You were a witness, what you believe to be true. And that's it. That's what we're to do with the gospel of Jesus Christ. What has the Lord done in your life? Just say it. There you go. You've been a witness. Now, you don't have to be an expert witness. You know, not everybody's a theologian. Not everybody's, you know, educated in all of apologetics and every part of theology. You just have to tell what you believe to be true. You know, if you were called upon to be a witness that you've witnessed a, a traffic accident, perhaps there was a, a guy in a red sweatshirt crossing the road and a blue pickup truck ran him down and you were called on a witness stand. You were there. What did you see? I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I saw a guy in a red sweatshirt crossing the road, and, and a blue pickup truck ran him down. You've done your job. 
You don't have to tell about the extent of the medical injuries. You don't have to tell about the trajectory of the fall and what impact it, the cranium had upon the concrete. You don't have to tell about the vehicle make model. All you need to do is tell what you believe to be true. And if you can do that, tell what you believe to be true of Jesus in your life, you could be a witness in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and whatever uttermost parts the Lord sends you in. You know, with advertisers, they know this because you see advertising in commercials, they usually pick a simple housewife to do a laundry ad. You know, like a housewife, she tries a new detergent. I tried the new detergent and it makes my whites brighter than they've ever been before. And so you're watching that, you're thinking, housewife, you think, I'll give that one a try. Now they could have the, the chemist come out, you know, they could have like a chemist walk out and, with his lab coat and say, well, here's what we have here, this new chemical pond compound with a neutralizing agent, and we have, uh, you know, the ions and the molecular uh, detergent that makes this process take, and explain chemically what is taking place, right? You can ask Bob Hefner about that. <laughs> and is that going to sell products? No. The general market just wants to hear the housewife say, I tried the new detergent, and it just makes my whites brighter than they've ever been before. But well, seriously, you don't have to be an expert theologian to tell someone about Jesus. All you have to say is, dude, my life was messed up. I gave my life to Jesus. He filled me with joy. He filled me with hope. He filled me with the Holy Spirit. And I have a relationship with God. I worship him. I hear his word. I'm living out my life, and I see fruit of it in my life, my family. That's all I can tell you. One guy, they asked, he came in contact with Jesus. Jesus healed him and said, what did Jesus actually do? What did he do to you? I don't know. All I know is that I once was blind, and now I can see. That's about it. And you could say that. That's being a witness. Now, we move on. There's a scripture I didn't read, but I'm about to. And this is Mark 16:15. Do we have Mark 16:15 up here? Mark 16:15 says, "And then he told him, "Go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone." So again, we're given this directive. We are given a directive from the Lord to go and preach the good news, the gospel. Gospel is good news. Good news is gospel. We're preaching. And the commandments that we heard so far, the first one was to make disciples. The second one we heard was to be my witnesses. But this one is to preach the gospel. Well, you could say, I'm not a preacher. It doesn't matter. All it is is declaring the good news, telling the good news. Just like that lady was preaching about the detergent, you could preach about Jesus. Now, there's a, a saying that's actually mistakenly attributed to St. Francis of Assisi that says, preach the gospel at all times and only when necessary use words. Now, this is not a biblical statement. The Bible doesn't say that. In fact, you see here, the Bible seems to say the opposite. Now, I understand the intent of the statement, and I agree that our life should be a message. Our deeds should show what our mouth is speaking about. Our actions should speak louder than words. But you cannot hide under that mistaken quote that says, I don't need to preach the gospel, I just live a good life and they see it. What is Jesus telling us? To go, tell the world, preach the good news to everyone. It's incumbent upon all of us to speak and teach and preach the gospel. It's what God has asked us to do. In fact, the King James Version actually says this. We don't have it, but it says, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And I can see why they changed it in the New Translations, because if you're cre preaching the gospel to every creature, does that mean like, you know, your dog and your cat and like bears in the woods and things like that? <laughs> This doesn't necessarily mean to go and preach the gospel to your pets. You might want to practice on your dog, you know, let them listen. They'll turn cockeyed and listen. One ear goes up. But you can practice preaching the gospel. But I don't, be I don't believe, I don't know, I don't believe that animals are able to receive salvation through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Sometimes you wish that they would. It reminds you of the joke of the, uh, the camper in the woods. <laughs> Guy's camping in the woods. He's in his tent at night. Christian man, a little time out for the Lord. And all of a sudden, in the middle of the night, a bear rips open his tent and is staring straight at him, a big grizzly bear. And he looks at the bear and he's praying, oh God, please God, let this bear be a, a Christian bear. And the bear is growling. Immediately, the bear stops, gets on its knees and says, 
Lord, I thank you for the food I'm about to receive. <laughs> A Christian bear. <laughs> But we're supposed to preach this message, preach the gospel. And what is the message that Jesus wants us to preach? What is it? Now, we know the message of the gospel. John 3, 16, probably the first verse that you've memorized, and that is, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. And so this is a great component to your message as you're formulating your message that you're going to preach to your friend, to your neighbor, to your brother, to the stranger in the world. But let's go back to what we read from John 17. That, remember that prayer that Jesus had with the Father and he was praying these things and he started out and he said, after saying all these things, Jesus looked up into the heavens and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son so he can give glory back to you. For you've been given him authority over everyone. He gives eternal life to each one you've been given. You've been given. And this is the way to have eternal life. How? To know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you've sent to the earth. This is eternal life. This is Jesus' utmost desire for us, for you, for me, but not just for you and for me, for your neighbor, for the stranger on the street for that poor kid in a village halfway around the world, is that they would know God, the one true God, and Jesus Christ, who is sent. This is not only central, but it's utmost importance, these two things, knowing God, the one true God, and knowing Jesus, it's utmost importance. This is the message that Christians have been propagating throughout the world through, for centuries, even to the remote parts of the world, even when travel and logistics were very inconvenient. Smuggling Bibles, going into hostile countries, bringing this news of relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And it's been going on for thousands of years. And you know what? You and I are a product of that. Either the person that told you about Jesus or the person that told the t person that told you about Jesus or before that and before that was a product of someone going out into all the world sharing the message of Jesus Christ. And so here we are sitting in this room today with assurance of salvation because of the work of someone who was doing the work of evangelism. Remember, this is all in the context of evangelism. And so with the w message going out to the world for so many years, why is it that so much of the world still remains in darkness. I'll tell you why. Because the enemy is at work constantly trying to undo the work of God, trying to distort and silence the message of the gospel, to corrupt and twist the truth. You know, the world is filled with false religions, religions that defy the things I just talked about, defying the word of God or covering or altering the Word of God. And so we send missionaries into Asia and other places where they're coming against generations of people who have lived under false religion. For instance, Asia is the most populated continent. You have China and India, Hindu, Buddhism, several other offshoots of those. Those religions defy what I said. They actually contradict what I said. Now, they, they don't do it straight on. What they do is they, they, they don't recognize that God is the one true God of all the earth. They don't recognize that Jesus' life meant anything to you or to me. And so they continue to teach the people for generations to, that they can ignore that. So we come against that with the truth of the gospel. How about the Far East, the Near East, the Middle East with Islam? Islam is a little different. It's a newer religion. At least Hindu and, and, and uh, Buddhism are almost as, or as old as Judaism, perhaps Hindu even older. Islam was, was created as a cult 600 years after Jesus was, was here on the earth. 600 years later. It started as a cult, but it spread in the dark ages by force. And what, they're, what they teach is that Jesus is not the Son of God. He was not even crucified, that he's not the Messiah that the Bible's mostly untrue. And this is propagated mostly by force. And that's what we come against as we preach the gospel to Muslims. And so, you know, and we are in a time where they, we see a lot of Islam and Muslim activity on, on the news and radical Muslims doing all kinds of, 
of evil. But you know what? Even if they were going around and feeding the poor and handing out flowers, the doctrine of Islam is in direct opposition to the truth of God. And so therefore, it's a problem. Therefore, we need to pray and see them coming out of darkness into the marvelous light. How about atheism? Atheism seems to be subtly being spread. Atheism, the belief that there is no God. Only science can prove what's true and what's not true. And it's, it's a presumed widespread belief that we face. Why do I say presumed? Because you walk into a college campus, a, 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 a particularly science class, or you just turn on the news, and the assumption there is that the audience doesn't believe in God. That's the assumption. So they speak in other terms, disregarding anything about God. That's usually the way things go. However, most of the world believes in a God, some form of God. In fact, the, the percentage of people in the, on the earth that don't believe in God is a very small percentage. The percentage of people that actually call themselves atheists in the United States is about 2%. So most, of the, most people believe in God, but atheism is this propagated, presumed belief that, you know, there is no God. And then you have others, just unbelief, you know. At least in Judaism, they believe everything we believe about God. They just have yet to receive Jesus as a Messiah. And that's another thing we come into. And I do a lot of Jewish evangelism explaining through Scripture how Jesus is a Messiah. Paul says this in Romans when he's talking about these other beliefs that they're facing as they're spreading the gospel in the first century. In Romans 1, let's read this. He says, But God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Let me just pa pause right there. It's not just that they don't have their doctrine, but they force their followers, their children, their generations to not believe in the truth of God. But let's go on. Verse 19 says this. They know the truth of God because he's made it obvious to them. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and the sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible, his invisible qualities, his eternal power, his divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. Yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or give him thanks. They began to think of foolish ideas of what God was like. As a result, their minds became dark and confused, claiming to be wise. They instead became utter fools, and instead of worshiping the glorious, ever-living God, they worshiped idols that made to look like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles. What we just read is that God's attributes, God's revealed himself through creation, so no one is without excuse. You know, God is real. It's not just a philosophy. He's real. It's what we believe. I was minister, minister. I was witnessing to a girl in Ocean Grove. She was a Jewish girl, but she kind of has strayed from Judaism. And she says, you know, I think God, whoever he or she may be, should just be someone who kind of looks out over people and lets them live their life. And as long as they're true to themselves, they have a reward, maybe in some type of nirvana, like heaven or something. And if not, they go back in and they have another life and they have the opportunity to prove themselves again. And, and I'm listening to her and I'm thinking, you know what? Actually, I'm thinking, I said to her, I said, that's actually not a bad idea. I kind of like that. You just kind of live your life. As long as you're true to yourself, you don't hurt anybody. God understands and he just kind of, you know, counts that as, that actually sounds pretty good. The problem is that there's a real God, and he has real ways, and he has a real law, and he's a real being. And so we don't tell him to do things our way. We must submit ourselves and do things his way. And that's the problem. We can't just create God in our own image. He created us in his image. You know, it's like going to, uh, I said, you know, it's like, like driving through a, 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 a town, perhaps, even out in the country, in the middle of the night, you got to get home. You're rushing to get home. You come up and you come to a red light and you stop. And you're out in the middle of nowhere. There's not a single soul around as far as you can see. There's no cars. And you're waiting at the light. And wait, and the light's taking forever. And now you're thinking it's broken, you know. There's nobody around. 
And so you just look around and say, you know what, I'm just going to go right through. I think you should just be able to go right through the red light if nobody's around. That should be really the law. So you go through the red light, and about a half a mile up the road, <laughs> police officer gets out of his car and says, license registration. You just ran a red light. I know, officer, but you know, I was waiting there a long time. There's nobody around. I don't even know where you came from. And I just think it should be that if you are out there by yourself and there's nobody around, you could safely go through after coming to a complete stop. You should just be able to go. And he might say, you know what? That's not a bad idea. I actually agree with that. I think you probably should be able to do it the way you said. However, there are traffic laws and you are getting a ticket for running a red light, period. End of story. And honestly, guys, that's how it is. God has his laws. God has his ways. We have to submit to that. We can't make it up as we go along. We have to submit to it. But the truth is, is it's eternal life. Jesus says this is eternal life, knowing God and Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. And that is actually the good news that the world needs to hear from us, that there is a way of reconciliation with the Father. It's, the, it's what we do in our mission trips. You, you might think our mission trips are all about you know, bringing food, helping people find water, shelter. That's a part of it. But we wouldn't do it at all if we couldn't do it with the gospel in our hand. I went to Haiti. My first trip in Haiti, I get to Haiti. It was a terrible experience. I get down there. I was overcome by the poverty. And I, I was alone. I was meeting a team. I couldn't believe how much poverty there was. People would with injuries that are never healed, twisted legs because they couldn't get their broken arm reset, their legs reset, the bugs, the smell, the squalor, with no relief. It's not like some mission trips I've been on. You go to the poor section, you minister, you go back to your hotel at night and talk about how bad it is down in that section. Haiti, the whole country is like that. I remember sifting rice. Our job was one afternoon was to sift a 50-pound bag of rice. What does that mean? You take a ri rice out of the bag, you're sifting it, for mealy bugs. <laughs> you pour the rice in, you, the mealy bugs fall out somewhere else. They were doing this for hours. I'm like, there's still a lot of mealy bugs in here. And finally, the, the, uh, the, the missionary comes over, he goes, he looks at our pot of rice, he goes, oh, that's fine. I said, there's still a lot of mealy bugs in there. Ah, that's fine. That's about as much as we eat. Eating bugs, sleeping on the ground with bugs. Crawling. Why are we doing this? Why don't I just take my plane ticket the money I would have spent and just send money so that they could have clean rice and clean water because we are to preach the gospel, to preach the gospel. That's what they need. And I remember sharing the gospel to these young Haitian kids, these poor Haitian kids, and telling them that, that yeah, we're, we're giving you sandwiches. <laughs> we're giving you some batteries. But we're also going to tell you how you can receive Jesus Christ so that you live your life. And when you die, Jesus says, that you can go where I am. And in my Father's house, John 14, there are many mansions. And where I go, I prepare a place for you so that when you die, you go to heaven in paradise with Jesus. And you know what they did? They got excited. More excited about the, the toys and the batteries. They got excited. They would sing this song called, we would sing it to them, called, Come and Go With Me to My Father's House. like I joie, joie, joie. Come and go with me to my father's house where there's joy, joy, joy. They'd sing it at the top of their lungs. That's what they needed. Yeah, they needed the food. Yeah, they needed the help. But more than anything else, they needed the hope of salvation. You know, the world will pat you on the back for ministry to the poor. Not so much for the ministry of the gospel, but that is the most important element of our ministries, whether it's, you know, feeding the poor or, or bringing justice to the un unjust situations, helping the needy. Urban Impact, Orphan Care, Poe River, all these, these fantastic ministries are fantastic because not only do they meet some type of need, but they bring the truth of eternal life to the people that need it most. And let me tell you, they need it. They need it most. God is a God that loves his people, loves all creation, and wants them to come into relationship with them. Relationship. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says this. It's this. This is the scripture that comes after, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Behold, all things pass away and become, become new. And then it says this. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. 
And all this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ, and God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. That's what evangelism is, reconciling people to the Father. The New King James says, all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and given us the ministry of reconciliation. You and I are given a ministry to reconcile the lost to the Father. He wants them. He wants relationship with them. How is he going to get it? Through you talking to your neighbor, through you preaching the gospel, through you being his witness. 1 Peter 3.15 says, but in your hearts revere Christ as Lord, and if someone asks about your Christian hope, always be ready to explain it. Are you ready to explain your hope to those that need it most? The world desperately needs hope. Desperately needs hope. It's a hopeless world. And 1 Peter 3.15, always be ready to give an account for the hope that you've been given. God's given you a great gift. Someone preached to you. He's given you that hope. And we see a lot of people that are hopeless. I'm sad to say, but a few weeks ago, a young girl here who came hopeless because her, her boyfriend had committed suicide. She was so hopeless, so distraught, emotionally sick. We, pr- we tried to pray for her, counsel her a little bit. She committed suicide that same week. You know, I have, I have a friend, not, not a close friend, a, a guy I graduated high school with, lived in the same town, graduated the same high school, same age as me, has two kids just like me, all have the same friends, same upbringing pretty much. Only difference is I have the hope of Jesus, and he was so hopeless, he threw himself off the George Washington Bridge last month. Hopeless. We have hope that desperate people need. How are they going to get it? How are they going to get it? How's it going to come out to them? Preaching the gospel. Preaching, sharing, being his witnesses. The world is sick. You have the cure. So what do we do? How do you preach the gospel? Tell, tell, tell what you believe to be true. Now, we're going to be doing some evangelism training Actually, it starts in, uh, on, on August 16th. We're doing another session of evangelism training. We are hoping that every person in the whole church will go through some t- form of evangelism training, even though our mark, our goal is to 50%. Um, speaking of mark, it's being done by our missions and outreach director, Mark Avery, and it's happening on the 16th. You think about Mark 16, go and preach the gospel. If you can come August 16th, there'll be a lunch, the whole bit, but more importantly, training on how to preach the gospel, particularly for those of you that have a tough time with it. And then one more thing I want to announce in closing as I'm winding down is that last night, Ali and I had a chance to do a concert in an outreach situation at the Atlantic, uh, Har- Atlantic Highlands Harbor Marina. Just open air outreach, sharing the gospel. Many people had never heard it before. We're going to do that as a church. We're going to take what we do here and bring it to our Jerusalem. What's our Jerusalem? Somerset County. On August 13th, we're going to... How many of you have been to Somerville lately? Somerville is a fantastic place lately. I've really regentrified. The streets are, have beautiful shops, restaurants, boutiques, cafes, ice cream, chocolate, you know, all kinds, music stores, several of them. And it's beautiful uh, walking section of, of, uh, of commerce and, and foot traffic. And they actually closed off the main street, Division Street, where there's tables and chairs and boutiques and shops, and ice cream, and coffee, and a big stage. Well, guess what? On September 13th, Sunday afternoon, we're going to take over that stage. We're going to put the Zarephath Worship Band there. Yeah. Pastor Rob is going to give a message to whoever would hear it. Some others will going to give testimony, and we're going to ask you to come and help us to tell people that there is hope in Jesus Christ. And you know what? That's the first of several outreaches that we're going to do like this. I want to tell you, we have exactly what the world needs. So let's not wait. Let's not hold it back. Let's not stuff it. Let's preach the gospel. Amen.